Okay, everybody, thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, tonight's shir is dedicated. Uh, it refers Shalema for Ari bin Yamin ben Sora Leah and Shoshana bas Rachel Leah. And for all of those whose health has been affected by the war, and especially for the safe and quick return of our brothers and sisters that are held in captivity. Amen. As well, in Aliyat Neshama for Yitzchak Kirsch ben Eliezer. Uh, as well as the mother of Larry and Lynn Finson, Shulamis Bat Chaim Mordechai, uh, on her second yard site, the 22nd of Shvat, and for Sholom Ber Ben Ephraim, Begisa Fagel, and Gitel Bat Shmuel and uh, Aida. Again, we hope that uh, the Divrei Torah should be Eloi, Eloi Nishmatam, and we thank everybody uh, for their support of Achzakas uh, Torah. Uh, you'll remember a few weeks ago, we read about uh, the four Lashonos of Geula. Uh, there are four terms of redemption that HaKadosh Baruch Hu used. Vod Seisi, I will take you out. I'm sorry, Vitsalti, I will take you out. I will save you. Vigalti, I will redeem you. Vilokakti. And these are why we have four cups of wine because of the four Lashonos of Geula, and we gave a share on the meaning of the four Lashonos of Geula. But the one thing that is interesting and relevant to this Parsha is that the fourth Lashon, I will take you unto me as a nation, is technically not referring to the Exodus at all. It is referring to Matan Torah. You will become my nation at Matan Torah. So it's very interesting, you see from here, that the giving of the Torah, which occurs in this Parsha, is not simply an extra thing. It is actually the essence of what the redemption from Mitzrayim is about. It is one of the Lishonos of Geula. It is the Tachlis of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. I remember years ago when there used to be the old uh, big bad Soviet Union. So during the 1970s, there was a lot of activism to kind of get the Jews out of the Soviet Union, free them, and every synagogue, conservative, reform, orthodox, had a big sign on the lawn saying, let my people go, which is a somewhat of a quote or a paraphrase from Exodus. But the truth of the matter is, the full Pasuk says, sholach ami, which is not let my people go, but sholach ami, send forth my people, vayavduni, so they will serve me. They left out the Vyavduni. In other words, it wasn't freedom alone that was needed. It was a freedom to be able to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And thus, Matan Torah is the fourth Lashon of Geula because it is the ultimate Tachlis of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And we see from this, uh, Chazal say in a number of different ways, that true freedom is not you get to do whatever you want, but true freedom is the ability to submit yourself to the Ratz and Hashem. Pirkei Yavos tells us, Ein ben chayren, el The only one who is free, chayren, is the person who is able to learn the Torah, keep the Torah, because otherwise we're just an animal. If I simply go whatever way my Yetzirah tells me to go, I'm a slave. Maybe I'm not a slave to some outside person, but I'm a slave to negative forces within myself. I'm not in control. I'm like a leaf that is being blown and buffeted by winds in all directions. It is precisely when you have Torah that gives you discipline and guidance and instruction that you're able to be free in the sense of bringing out the beauty of your neshama, bringing out your potentiality. Chazal say as well that the grain offering of Pesach is the Omer offering on the second day of Pesach and the Omer offering is barley on Shavuos, the grain offering are two loaves of wheat bread. Now Chazal say barley was generally, at least before the invention of Cholent, barley was generally given to animals. <coughs> wheat was generally consumed by human beings. The freedom of Pesach, of Yitziat Mitzrayim, as lovely and beautiful and fundamental as it is, just gives me the freedom of an animal. Animal liberation. It is Matan Torah that transforms animal liberation to human dignity and human freedom. And thus, Matan Torah is an integral part of Geulas Mitzrayim because it is the tachlis, it is the purpose of that Geula 
uh, to begin with. I mentioned a number of times, I'll just repeat it very quickly, uh, Tagari, a very famous Indian poet who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he compared a human soul to a violin string that is capable of making beautiful, beautiful music, but only when the string is tied down. If you had a loose string on the table, totally free, unencumbered, not held down in any way, you would not be able to get any music out of that string. You tie it down, you constrict it, you limit its movement, <coughs> then and only then can it produce music. The same thing for a human being. We think if I could just do whatever I want, I would be free. The answer is no. I wouldn't be able to focus. I wouldn't be able to realize the kochot, the powers, the abilities that is within me. It's only submission to the structure that allows even one's creativity to come out. Right? And that's the idea of Ein Ben Choren, Elami Sha'osek Patora. No one is free except one who learns Torah. This is why we go from Sa'orim, a barley offering on Pesach, to Chitim. Uh, and this is why, in effect, although it's not the time of year yet, the counting of the Omer is a linkage between Pesach and Shavuos. There's a comment of the Ramban. The Ramban views the whole period of counting of the Omer as a Chol Hamoe, meaning to say Pesach and Shavuos are one long holiday with a you know 49 day Chol Hamoe. So when you tell your boss you don't work during Chol Hamoe, then you disappear for all of Svirasa Omer, you have the right to do so, although I doubt that the job will be held open if you simply don't show up for 49 days. Uh, but be it as it may, Ramban says, Shavuos is not a separate holiday. Shavuos is the last days of the Pesach Shavuos continuum because once again, it is the culmination, it is the purpose of, of, of redemption. So in a sense, that's why Parshat Yisro is still in Shovavim. Shovavim are the weak Shmos, Ve'era, Bo, Veshalaf, Yisro, Mishpatim because once again, uh, even though Shovavim is about being liberated from your inner Mitzrayims, Matan Torah is a chalak, an integral part of that liberation of the slavery of, of Egypt. My own Rosh Hashiva in Orsameach, Rav Anata Schiller, he should be well, his, his health has taken some difficult downturns, but Bezer Hashem, he should have a refuah shlema, uh, used to say that when we talk about free will and you ask somebody, what is free will? What is Bechira? So the standard answer would be, Bechira is my ability to do whatever I want. Not that I'm allowed to. God doesn't want me to do whatever I want, but I have the power to do whatever I want. So Rabbi Schiller always said that an animal can do whatever it wants. Bechira is the power to do what you don't want to do and the power not to do what you want to do. It's the other way around. The real kayach of Bechira is the override that we have over our natural inclinations. That is what a Baal Bechira is. A person who simply automatically responds to whatever they desire at the moment is not really exercising free will. They are simply a victim of their nature, whatever their nature is. Choice involves overriding your nature. In fact, even in a secular standpoint, the idea of deferred gratification, I want something, but I realize that it's better if I wait. In fact, what's the story? This is a very famous experiment in social psychology where they offered little children a choice. You can have the candy right now or if you wait uh, 10 minutes or something, you'll have two candies. So some kids said, I want the candy now. Other kids waited 10 minutes. And they tracked these children over many years. And it was determined that those who were able to defer gratification for 10 minutes were much more successful in life because they realized <laughs> that you don't make decisions based on the immediate short term. But you look at the long-term consequences. So Bechira is not, I do what I want. Bechira is I sometimes do what I don't want because it is better for me in the long term. Now granted, that experiment only involved 10 minutes, but you know, for, uh, for an eight-year-old, 10 minutes is an eternity. Uh, so they still were exercising uh, their Bechira in a very, very responsible way. So, 
course, um, there's an old joke from Yaakov Kamenetsky. It's a little bit of a cynical joke, and, but, it, but it, like, like jokes go, it actually has truth. The famous Maimer Chazal, no one is free except they learn Torah. You know, if you're in yeshiva, so Baruch Hashem, you have a lot of friends who are getting married. So there's always a chasna to go to. Now, especially with Yushalayim, there's always a chasna. If New York City, there's always chasnas. So as a result, you know, guys are always taking off. They got to leave Yeshiva to go to Detroit or go to Chicago or go to Los, Los Angeles. And Rav Yaakov didn't like that. He felt that if you're learning in Yeshiva, you don't take off just to go to friends' weddings. So he said he now understands the meaning the only person that's free is a person who learns Torah because any other job you have, you can't tell your boss every other day, I got to leave. If you're in yeshiva, you can tell your boss, I got to go to a chasna, got to go to shever brachas, got to go to a bris, got to go to a pigeon, a ben. So he says, only the one who's learning Torah is free to do whatever he wants. Of course, that's a cynical interpretation. The other interpretation is the opposite, that it's the discipline of life that allows the flourishing of my inner kochot. That's Tagari's beautiful mashal, that the violin string produces music only when it is tied down and not when it's totally loose. He was not speaking about Judaism. He, I don't even know if he knew a Jew, but he's speaking about life in general. And the truth of the matter is, once again, to draw on a secular analogy, you know, you look at, um, uh, jazz musicians, right? They improvise, they play riffs, they just play whatever they want. Or you look at an artist like Picasso, who does abstract, who did abstract art and the like. And then, you know, you're learning how to play the piano and you're told you gotta practice uh, scales, like three hours. Or you uh, wanna be, a, wanna be a, an artist, a painter. So you have to kind of paint, you know, plants or, or paint bowls of fruit, you know, for a week. And you say, I don't want to do that. I want to improvise. I want to be creative. I want to express my individuality. Why am I forced to play scales? Why am I forced to paint apples? But you have to understand that the difference between Picasso and a three-year-old who can simply scribble on a piece of paper is that Picasso learned the technique. He learned the art. And then he was able to transcend it. He was then able to go beyond it but he was able to go beyond it in a very creative way, only because he mastered the fundamentals. The jazz musician who plays riffs, once again, how is that different from a kid who just bangs on a piano? The answer is because it, it, it is a creativity and an individuality that comes after the mastery of something. Once you tie yourself down, you're then free to fly, uh, like a kite, right? A kite that's rooted, tied down in the ground, or somebody's holding it, the kite can go very, 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 very high. But if it's simply not tied down anywhere, nobody's holding it. It just goes into the stratosphere and it's lost. <laughs> Torah learning is that way as well. God wants us to be involved in Torah in a very creative way, to innovate, to rethink things, to make new connections. That's called chidush, right? It's the notion of innovating in Torah. And each person, is given a chilek, a portion in Torah, that is their portion to develop. It's hard to understand this, meaning each and every one of us has a certain insight in Torah that even Rashi didn't have. Now, going back, uh, well, Moshe Rabbeinu probably had everything, but let's say, uh, you know, whatever it would be, David HaMelech didn't have. And that's our prayer in the Amidah, V'sein Chalkeinu B'Torah Secha. Give us our portion in the Torah. Show me my portion. Show me what is my insight. What is my understanding? So I can share it, so I can develop it myself, and I can share it with the world. But in order to be able to develop your insight, you also have to be rooted in the basics, rooted in the fundamentals. Then you're like a kite that's rooted, tied down, anchored, and then you can fly to very, very high levels. Otherwise, you just go into outer space and you're gone, right? So that's the same idea here, that the creativity of life has to be rooted in a basic commitment and submission to the tools of the craft, whether it's the service of God, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's philosophy, whatever, whatever it would be. And this is the episode of Ein Ben Chorin so I want to talk a little bit just about Matan Torah again in perhaps very, very general terms. 
Uh, there is a Gemara in Masechus Shabbos where uh, a man from Galil, the Galil, and he's not given a name, we're not, no, we're not told who it is, made a statement, and the Gemara just quotes the statement and gives no explanation for it. Berich Rachamana, blessed is God, the Yoyevlan, this is Aramaic, the Yoyevlan who gave us a Raisa to Lisai, a threefold Torah, that's the Torah, the prophets, the Nevi'im, the Kesuvim, the writings, Liam to Lisai, to a threefold nation, Kohanim, Levi'im, Yisraelim, Biyarcha to Lisai, in the third month, counting from Nisan, which is always month number one, so Nisan or Sivan, Matan Torah was on the, either the sixth of Sivan or the seventh, that's a Machlokas, after three days of separation and preparation. And that's all it says. Baruch Rechmana, thank you God, who gave us all of these threes. <coughs> so apparently, the Gemara is making a point that the number three is very significant in connection with Matan Torah. Just as four happens to be very significant in connection to Pesach, right? The Pesach Seder has a whole bunch of fours. Uh, we have the four questions, the Manishtana. We have four cups of wine. We have four terms of redemption. We have four sons. Right? So the number four is very important in the Seder. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But the number three is very important when it comes to Matan Torah. What is the chashivas? What is the significance? What is the importance of the number three? So Maharal of Prague, Maharal of Prague was very uh, into, among many, many things, he was into numerology, again, based on Kabbalah. Uh, he was into s numbers having symbolic values that represent spiritual ideas. And he makes the point that three is connected to synthesis, integration, and harmonization of opposite forces. The example would be, imagine if you have a line, a simple horizontal line, that has opposite points. There's a point at each end of the line. The points are moving in opposite directions. You then draw diagonals from the outer point to create a triangle, the size of a triangle, and they meet at the apex of the triangle. So now you started off with a two-point line, and now you have a three-point triangle. But what is the triangle? What is the apex of a triangle? It synthesizes and integrates and combines the two opposite points. So the morale says, symbolically, whenever we have a number three, it represents, as we would say, later philosophical terms, a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis in which opposite forces are harmonized. In Kabbalah, this is very much so. If you go to the lower seven spherot, the lower, we're not, not counting Chachma Bina, uh, Keser Chachma Bina, that uh, are the higher spheros, but the lower spheros, so the first three, which is all, all we need to talk about, is Chesed, loving kindness, Gevura, inner strength and discipline, and the third synthesis, and the third factor is called Tiferes, which is beauty. Avram represents the spiritual force of chesed. Yitzchak represents the spiritual force of constriction, limitation, fear of God. But when they are harmonized in the personality of Yaakov, that reaches a beauty, the combination, the mizug. Because spiritually, uh, each force by itself could be dangerous. Chesed is a wonderful thing. But I don't know if you ever saw these old situation comedy motifs of an ice cream machine that you can't shut off, like soft ice cream. It produces the soft ice cream and the ice cream comes out and out and out and you can't shut it off so it keeps on filling the room. You know, it's, I think it's an old Lucille Ball type of, uh, type of stuff. So that's chesed. Chesed is giving, 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 giving. But I get overwhelmed with the light of God. It's not just being overwhelmed. I cease to exist. I can't have my autonomy in the light and revelation of godliness. I become absorbed, just as a candle would be totally subsumed in the light of the sun. This is infinitely more so. So Gavura requires 
See, people think Gevura is punishment. I mean, punishment is an aspect of it. Gevura is really withdrawal. Gevura is holding back. Gevura is necessary for me to receive chesed. I can't receive the chesed of God. My kli, my vessel, is too weak to hold that light. God has to hold back his light and to a certain degree of concealment. So Gevura itself is what enables chesed to be received. But Gevura is not per se punishment. Gevura is withholding. That may be a punishment, but that also may be the mechanism by which I receive chesed. So too much chesed, you have this, you're overwhelmed, you cease to exist. Too much Gevura, I'm starving for kirvat elokim. Tiferis, beauty, is the synthesis between chesed and gevura. And the same thing in human behavior, because whatever the avos did is the avos mimicked. Right? There's kind of a double mimicking going on, a double limitation theory. We imitate God, and by our imitation of God, God imitates us. Many of you may have heard or learned the beautiful sefer, Tomer Devorah, uh, written by the great Makobel, Rav Moshe Cordovero, who uh, was an older contemporary of the Arizal. He died a little right. Well, the Ari died at 39, the Rav Moshe Cordovero died at 48, but he died shortly before the Arizal. And they do represent two different schools of Kabbalah. Uh, the Ramak, uh, Rav Moshe Cordovero, is one school of Kabbalah. It's actually a very, very interesting rationalist school. Uh, the Ramak tried to uh, explain Kabbalah as a philosophical system. The Arizal is a more complicated, I mean, Ramak is very complicated too, but the Arizal was more complicated because it kind of became more intuitive, intuitive and free association and could not be explained in linear ways. Ramak was a philosopher of Kabbalah. Uh, the Ari was kind of directly experiencing mystical visions. But one of the Ramak's most beautiful books and most accessible book is Tomer Devorah, where he shows how the, why by imitating God's midot, we actualize God's midos in the world. So it's a double imitation. I look at the 13 midos of Rachamim, and I try to carry them out in my own life. But by my carrying them out in my own life, I elicit that response from God. I imitate God, then God imitates me and brings that into the uh, into the world. So when we say Avram represents Chesed and Yitzchak represents Gevura and Yaakov represents Teferis, this is the human concretization of these divine attributes which in turn bring those divine attributes into the world. Bring them into the world. So the, the commentaries say that too much Chesed produces a Yishmaya, a deficiency. Too much Gevura on the part of Yitzchak produces an Esau. It's only Yaakov Avinu who melded and molded and balanced and harmonized chesed and gevura that we have what is called Tiferes beauty. And beauty produces mitaso shalema, all of Yaakov's children. We had our problems to be sure. Bechiras Yosef, the Chedo Egel, I mean, we're not perfect. But all of us, every Jew, has the special Kedusha of that unique nation. There is nothing that's rejected. There is nothing that is cut off. And that is because Tiferis, right? Even in parenting, this is very clear. I give my kid everything he wants, chesed, I'm actually hurting him. I'm not giving him boundaries. I'm not giving him limitations. I'm too limiting, I also destroy him. A parent has to balance chesed and gvura. Now this is why the Midah of Tiferes, which is beauty, is called beauty. Because true beauty is the harmonization of opposite forces. Right? The beauty of a symphony, the beauty of a work of art, is when you mold disparate elements into a harmonious whole. Tiferes is also called truth. Now, the famous uh, British uh, poet John Cates said truth is beauty, oh, I think owed to a Greek or a Grecian urn or something. So uh, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. I'm not sure if he based it on Kabbalah, but it is undoubtedly true that in the world of the spheros, 
Tiferes, which is beauty, is also called emes. And Tiferes is the term that is applied to the Torah. We know, in fact, that Yaakov Avinu of the three patriarchs is the most that's directly connected to Torah. Remember the world, remember the world stands on three pillars? Pirkei Avo says, Torah, learning Torah, Avoda, divine service, Gemilas Chassad of loving kindness, and the Mephoshim all explain, Avram represents service to God through loving kindness, and Yitzchak, who was willing to give his life as a korban, represents divine service. Yaakov, who spent 14 years in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver, is the Koach of Torah. So you see the connection here. Yaakov represents Tiferes, beauty. Beauty is emes. Torah is emes. Yaakov represents Torah. That is why the Maharal, who wrote a whole sefer on Matan Torah, he wrote a sefer on the Exodus that is called Gevuro Sashem, the might of God, and he wrote a sefer on Matan Torah. Many, many, a big sefer that is called Tiferes, Yisrael, the beauty of Israel. Torah is Tiferes, Tiferes is Emes. So now, let's go back to the significance of the number three. Maral says, the significance of three, just like Chesed, Gevurah, Tiferes, triangle, is the synthesis of opposite forces. So too, the Torah synthesizes forces that are otherwise opposite and opposing within the human personality. And that is the goof and the neshama. We are, all of us, fundamentally schizophrenic <coughs> because we have two identities. We have a spiritual soul that is the breath of God, the essence of God. As the Zohar says, when I breathe into you, I give a person mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, part of my very life force goes into them. So in a sense, as the Mekubalim say, our neshamos are very different than any other neshamos. The soul of every other creature, the living force, is something God created. And God said, let there be cows. And God said, let there be dogs. So they were created through God's speech. Our soul was not created by God's speech. Our soul was created by God's breath. That's very, very different. In a sense, again, it's very hard to understand this, and this can be misunderstood. Our soul is not a created entity at all, because God was pre-existing. God breathed, whatever that means, I don't know what it means, to tell you the truth. God breathes into us his breath. Now, God's breath was not created God's breath is part of God because God is an indivisible unity. And God breathed his breath into us. So this is the meaning of the oft-repeated statement. Our neshamos, our chelak, eloka, mimal, is an actual part of God. And as the Balatanya emphatically says, chelak, eloka, mimal, mamash. He has the word mamash. It really is. Now, <clears throat> this gives rise to a lot of things. You know, you know, the truth of the matter is, these Kabbalistic ideas have become common currency. I mean, you can, you can hear any mashkiach, any uh, yeshiva rabbi, say, our neshamos are chaylek alokamimal. It's, it's a common way of describing it. One should know there's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous controversy. Uh, on those very words. And uh, this was one of the great, great controversies that the Vilna Gaon had against the Hasidic movement. We know that the Vilna Gaon did not get involved in Jewish politics too much. The Vilna Gaon's only interest in life was to serve Hashem, to learn Torah, to teach Torah. He was not interested. The Vilna Gaon was not a Rav. He was not a Rosh Hashiva. Uh, he did not have any position in the Jewish community other than the fact that he was the greatest, you know, guttle of the generation. But he did not get involved in too many things outside of his learning and outside of his teaching. But one of the very, very few issues that he was very aggressive about was his opposition to the development of this new Hasidic movement. And uh, to this, you know, he signed uh, excommunications, different bands, and the like. 
Now the story of why the Vilna Gaon was opposed to Hasidus is a complicated story and it's a multifaceted story and one of the interesting things, maybe we'll give a share on it sometime, is his own disciple, Rav Chaim Volazhener, who was very, very close to the Vilna Gaon, uh, did not sign the bans against Hasidus. Many great rabbis joined the Vilna Gaon, Rav Chaim Volazhener did not. People speculate, why? He was so close to the Vilna Gaon. How, how could he not sign the Vilna Gaon's ban on Chassidus? So I think the explanation he himself gave was, how dare he sign uh, a ban with the Vilna Gaon? That would imply like the Vilna Gaon needs his agreement, and of course he doesn't need his agreement, so he's not going to sign. In reality, however, it's very, very clear that Rav Chaim Volozhner had a much more conciliatory view of Chassidus than the Vilna Gaon, and in fact, in the great yeshiva of Volozhna, uh, he uh, admitted Hasidic students. And they even say, although maybe uh, that's not a proof, that his own son, Rabbi Yitzchak of Volozhna, who became the Rosh Hashiva of Volozhna after Rav Chaim died, and Rabbi Yitzchak of Volozhna was the father-in-law of the Nitziv, that Rabbi Yitzchak of Volozhna has Hasidic books in his library that he sometimes read. But again, that's no proof. Rizik of Lashen Bichlau was a very independent character. He wanted to go to medical school at one point. The Bechav Chaim Bechlau used to say, I founded the whole yeshiva so my son shouldn't go to medical school. And the fact that I kept him out of medical school, Dayenu, that justified the whole yeshiva. So it's not a riot. But, so the, 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 the actual controversies the Vilna Gaon had with Hasidus are complicated. But one of them involves this issue. <coughs> And again, I'm just going to mention issues. I'm not going to address them or answer them or fully explain them because they are Kabbalistic. And that is the notion that within every person is not just God created me, but God is within me. The breath of God, the chelak elokam mimal, if you think about it, creates enormous theological problems that are connected to pantheism. I'm God. Your God. And then some would even extend it to the inanimate. You know, God is, is, is here, God is there. If everything is God, then no one is God. Why do I have to listen to God if I'm God? So the Vilna Gaon did not like to talk about, you know, the essence of God is within me. It says God creates me, God sustains me. God is my creator, but not that God is in me per se. So we're not gonna get into it, but, but suffice it to say, that we do believe, at least mainstream at this point, just as um, John Kennedy, uh, President JFK, said uh, back in, this, in the uh, early 60s, he went to uh, West Berlin and he said, we are all Berliners. So the truth is, uh, we are all Kabbalists today. Uh, people don't realize that Kabbalah has taken over mainstream Judaism, whether you like it or not. Uh, we routinely utilize the vocabulary of Hasidic and Kabbalistic thoughts as the common method of expression. Okay, that's a bit of a digression. All I'm saying is, our souls are a spiritual entity. The breath of God. And the soul only has one desire. The only thing the soul wants is to be connected to its roots. To be connected to God through Torah, through mitzvot, through Masim Tovim, through Avas Yisrael. But we are also bodies. Our bodies, our Yetzirah, you can describe it different ways, has many other things that it wants. It seeks taiva, physical pleasures, laziness, whether it's food or sexual relations, or accumulation of money, or sleep. So we have this irreconcilable conflict between body and soul. We have this conflict between gashmius, physicality, and ruchnius, spirituality. And sometimes on a good day, the ruchnius wins and the Yetzir Tov is victorious. And there are going to be other times in which the other side wins and we get pulled down. How do you navigate it? It's like that line with two opposite points, the Ruchnius, the Gashmius. Sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm there. 
But the Torah, says the Maral, is connected to the magic number three because the Torah creates a synthesis, an integration, a harmonization of body and soul. Because the Torah teaches us that you can serve God not only by avoiding physicality and materialism, like by davening, learning, getting away from the physical, but you can serve God within the context of physicality itself. You can eat and enjoy your food, but by making brachos and by having gratitude to Hashem and by having kavana that at least in part I'm eating to give me the health to be able to serve Hashem better. So as the Rambam himself writes, at that point, even the physical activities you're engaged in become kadash, they become holy, they become elevated, they become spiritualized. A person plays basketball, a person jogs. Now the Rambam makes a very interesting point about physical activity. Actually, it's a very fascinating point. And everyone knows that the Rambam was, of course, a physician. And he was a very famous physician. The Rambam was actually one of the great physicians of the Middle Ages. And along with his halakhic works that are still, and the philosophical works that are, of course, still learned, he also wrote many medical works. Again, I, I would say that they're less studied, and maybe for good reason, but he, he wrote treatises on asthma and on stomach uh, problems and the like. But in the Mishnah Torah itself, he incorporates two chapters in Hilchus Deus on exercise and diet and things that will pr uh, help you from, uh, from getting ill and the like. And in fact, uh, much of that medical advice is still considered valid. And uh, there are even diet books, modern diet books, that are written based on the Rambam's suggested diet and the like. So the Rambam was a very big advocate, as you would expect, for physical health, including diet, exercise, sleep, all of the things that we would normally associate today. But in his introduction to Pirkei Avos, that's called the Shemona Prakim, he makes a very fascinating point. He says, that the only thing that a person should think about in life is, whenever you have to make a decision, is this going to bring me closer to Hashem? Or is this going to take me further from Hashem? And every decision has to be made in light of that purpose. Now he says, all of us would agree generally that if somebody is addicted to food, that's kind of a disgusting thing. Oh, what, you know, food, sex, you know, why is he addicted to it all the time? And yet, we don't think that way, the Rambam says, if somebody is addicted to health. Let's say the person, now there are people who are addicted to exercise. They jog, you know, eight hours a day, whatever it is. We think, well, that's virtuous. We look at that guy, the Rambam says, and says, that's a sadic, he takes care of himself. And we look at that guy, that guy's a glutton. The Rambam says, what's the difference? One guy's addicted to food, and one guy's addicted to good health. He says, health? is not inherently more virtuous than any other addiction. Ah, but the greatness of good health is it's not an intrinsic good. It is what we call an instrumental good. By good health, I'm able to serve Hashem. I'm able to live longer and do more mitzvahs. I'll be there for my spouse and children. See, it's a very interesting point. Health is very important, but health is important not because it's intrinsically valuable. He says it's no more intrinsically valuable than anything else you do with your life. But health is the means that can bring you to the things that are truly important. And that's why, indeed, the Rambam says there's a mitzvah to take care of your health. But one should not look at health as the end all of life. The purpose of my life is not to be healthy. This is an old joke they say about uh, the, uh, the person who went on an exercise program. He said, well, you know, I got good news. Uh, if you jog, you can add five years to your life. But those are the five years that you're jogging. So you don't come out necessarily so much ahead in terms of that. Right? So health is not the end of things. But health is a means. So here is the point. The Rambam writes that if I play basketball, I jog, and I do so with the kavana that I want to be healthy to be able to serve Hashem, that becomes serving God. The exercise is serving God. The jogging is serving God. 
if I go to see the Grand Canyon, because by looking at the grandeurs of nature, I have a sense of awe. That can become a go this uh, if I go to look at beautiful places simply because beauty calms my spirit and it gives me serenity. And when I have serenity, I can concentrate on davening better, whatever it would be. That becomes a Vodas Hashem. And the Rambam says that this is the meaning of Chazal's statement. Kol ma'asecha yiyu l'shem shamayim. All of your deeds should be for the sake of heaven. Not just the religious deeds, not just your learning, not just your davening, but your jogging and your traveling and your going on vacation and your eating. Do it l'shem shamayim. Now again, we're, we're, most of us are not on the madrega where we can do it 100% that way. There's always going to be, in fact, indeed, part of why God put taste into food is so that we'll eat what we need to eat. If we wouldn't have any taste, we might, you know, uh, maybe be good for our diet. <laughs> we would lose weight, but we wouldn't eat what we need to eat. So Hashem creates colors and tastes and textures precisely so we'll be attracted to things. But if you just add a little Hashem Shemayim, to what you're doing, then you have transformed the mundane, the secular, the physical, the material to holy work. Avodas Hashem. That's a great thing. Holiness is not necessarily by withdrawing from the material world. Holiness is even higher when you can elevate the material world by sanctifying it. L'shem Shemayim. So the morale says going back to the original question, this is why the Torah is connected to the number three. It takes the needs of the body and the needs of the soul that would otherwise be irreconcilably opposite and gives us a way to synthesize it, them and integrate them in which my body gets its due and at the same time that is feeding the neshama as well. Actually, last week, that, that's one of the lessons of Tubishvat. You take the payros, you take the eating, and you elevate it. Uh, l'shem, l'shem HaKadosh Baruch right? So this is the esod of why so many parts of Matan Torah are connected to the number three. In fact, Babich Rebbe says an interesting point. Again, this is more connected to Shavuos, but, uh, but I'll mention it. You know, this part is the part of Matan Torah. Everyone knows that there's a, a, a widespread custom in Klau Yisrael that uh, people try to stay up all night, uh, Shavuos night, learn all night. And the source of that minog is a medrash that says that the night before Matan Torah, the Jewish people went to sleep and Hashem came at the crack of dawn to give them the Torah and people are still sleeping so God had to wait for us whatever that means. And therefore, in order to make up, in order to rectify the fact that we kept God waiting, we kind of get up before dawn. That's why I tell people, if you can't stay up all night and your question is, should I learn late or get up early? I think the logic of the custom is to get up early because I think the main point is that when the dawn comes, you are there to receive the Torah. So instead of learning till 2.30 or 3, uh, Go to, if you can't stay up all night, go to sleep at uh, 10 and you know, get up so you're up before dawn and therefore you're rectifying the sin of Am Yisrael uh, who, uh, who slept when God showed up in the morning. Right? This is a medrash. Now the medrash doesn't bring the minog. The minog developed much later. The minog developed in the time of Rav Yosef Cairo and, and the like, but it's based on this medrash that Klal Yisrael were asleep. So the Rebbe asked a very simple question. You know, you know, you're told that the next day you're going to get the Torah. And this is the very purpose of Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim. And for 49 days you were preparing yourself, going up from level to level. We left Mitzrayim on the 49th level of Tuma, but by the end of the Omer period we had reached the 49th level of holiness. So we're going to sleep and we're not going to get up in time? And most of us probably wouldn't have been able to sleep, you know, Matan Torah the next day. How could, how could you sleep? And how can you get up late? So the Rebbe explained that this sleep was a very different type of sleep. This was a holy sleep. There's a medrash, another medrash that describes the sleep that there were no mosquitoes, there were no flies. There was an aura of holiness. 
And the idea of the sleep was that sometimes when a person wants to reach great levels of Kedusha, they cannot do so in the confines of a physical body. The goof is a machitza. The goof is a barrier to communion with God. So that the great tzaddikim, and the Vilna God writes this, their neshamos, their godly souls, not their biological soul, their godly soul leaves their body, goes up to Shemayim, absorbs all sorts of secrets and wisdom which it couldn't really comprehend in a physical body, and then comes down. That's one of the reasons, you know, it's a well-known idea that sometimes when you have a problem that you can't figure out, you go to sleep and you wake up with the answer. Somehow, right, your subconscious mind figured things out. Well, Kabbalistically, the way this would be explained is when your neshama escaped the confines and limitations of the physical guf, it was able to reach a higher level of perception that it then brings back to you. In fact, this might be one of the reasons for sleep, right? In fact, uh, a very interesting philosophical question, a spiritual question is, why on earth did God create us with the need to sleep? I mean, you know, look at how many hours of our lives are spent in sleep. That's even if you sleep, I mean, let's assume you sleep three hours a night, how many hours that is. And, you know, if you sleep more than that and you need to sleep more than that, what's the tachlis that I kind of am dead for so many hours every day? It's a very good question. Like, what is the purpose of sleep? One of the reasons is that this is an occasion for your neshama to escape the body and achieve perceptions of ruchnias that you otherwise wouldn't be able to perceive and then it comes back. Now, we're not always on that madrega either, but among the great tzaddikim, they achieve great, great aliyot in the concept of sleep. By the way, the Rebbe gave another reason for sleep in a different talk. He said, the purpose of sleep is to give us a sense of renewal because otherwise a person Let's assume that I did Averis and everything else and I feel it's dragging. I feel that I haven't accomplished. I feel that I'm a failure. But when I sleep and it's a new day, so psychologically I feel a little liberated from that past. It's a way of giving a person a sense that something new is happening. If you wouldn't sleep, there would never be a newness to your life per se. Okay, but be this it may, the Reb going back to the Shavuos thing. So the Rebbe said, Klal Yisrael slept the night before Matan Taira. Not because they were stomped sleeping. They slept because they thought that would be an alias neshama. They wanted their neshamas to absorb higher emes from God. And they felt they could do this only if the neshama transcended the body. So, that sounds good. So what's the Aveira? The Aveira is that Matan Torah is not about escaping the physical. Matan Torah is serving God within the physical. Yeah, they had a cheshman. They had a very, very good cheshman. But that's not what Torah is about. Torah does not say, serve God by rejecting the physical. The Torah says, serve God by taking the physical and elevating it. And therefore, yes, be in your body. Stay in your body. Remain with your physicality and serve Hashem by elevating it. And that's kind of the tikkun of staying up all night in our tired, you know, uh, lack of focus state in which we're serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu with our guf and not only with our, with our neshama. And the, going back to the maral, again, I'm combining different things, this is the idea of the taira connected to the number three. Three is synthesis, integration, harmony. Chesed Gevura Teferes is what, actually, actually, I should clarify, if you've been following me, I've actually mentioned two different types of synthesis. One is Chesed Gevura Teferes. The other is body-soul integration. And there was really speaking about two different integrations. The Torah integrates the Midah of Chesed with the boundaries. And the Torah integrates the Ruchnius and the Gashmius, right? Those are two different integrations but both of them are subsumed under three, which is Tiferes, beauty, which is Torah, which is Emes, truth. Truth can only exist 
when conflicting opposite forces are harmonized and balanced and you don't go to one extreme or another. Extreme will always be a distortion of MS. And that itself has a lot of relevance to many other questions as well. Um, okay, so now I just want to give you one more example of this. And this is a thought from another Hasidic Rebbe, the great Rav Sadok of Lublin, who died in 1900. And he points out that uh, right before the Aseris Adibros, the morning of the 6th of Sivan or the 7th of Sivan, there's actually a machlokas in the Gemara, was the Torah given on the 6th of Sivan or was the Torah given on the 7th of Sivan? By the way, I just want to point out just for your own knowledge, and I'm not going to address this. This is not a machlokas when Shavuos is. People sometimes get confused. Oh, we have a machlokas in the Gemara. Is Shavuos 6 or 7? No, Shavuos is Vada the 6th. But there's a machlokas. Did we get the Aseris Adibros on Shavuos? Or did we get it the day after Shavuos? And indeed, the Magen of Ram asked the Kasha, what's the sense here? If the Torah was given on the 7th, why would we celebrate Shavuos on the 6th? Good Kasha, we'll talk about it later, but it doesn't change it. Shavuos is not affected by this controversy. But this controversy is historical. Was the Torah given on the 6th? Or was it given on the 7th? But that morning, it describes kolos, there was thunder, ubrakim, and lightning flashes. And Chazal even say that they heard, uh, th I'm sorry, they saw the sound and they heard the colors. In other words, uh, there was, what do they call Kinesthesia, there's that thing where your different senses move Synesthesia. in opposite things. What is it called? Synesthesia. Synesthesia, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they experienced that. So look at what it says. Kolos ubrakim. Thunder and lightning flashes. And then Hashem gives the Aseris Adibros, or the first two. That itself is a big machlokas. And we hear only two, and then we ask Moshe to be the intermediary. That's how Rashi understands it. Or did we hear all ten? That's a big, big machlokas. We shine him. What exactly did we hear? But after we heard what we heard, it then repeats, everybody saw the kolot, the thunder, the lapidim and the torches, the flames in the sky. So Rav Sadek points out, there is a subtle distinction between the pre-Matan Torah description and the post-Matan Torah description. Pre-Matan Torah, it's kolos uverakim, Thunder and lightning. After Matan Torah, it says kolos velapidim. Thunder and torches. Very small difference, flames. But Rav Tzavik wants to suggest that the difference in the visualization of Am Yisrael represents a spiritual transformation pre-Matan Torah and post Matan Torah. Even before the Torah was given, the human being, even a non-Jew, has a spiritual desire to be connected to God. The statement that everyone is created in the image of God applies to Jew and non-Jew. But without a Torah, you can only achieve holiness by rejecting the physical. The physical is going to drag you down. The physical is going to connect you to your animal self. So you only can achieve Kedusha. That is why, for example, Christianity, or at least Catholicism, requires celibacy. Because in the act of a sexual union, you're going to be dragged down. Poverty, whether it works or not, is, is another question. But nevertheless, the model of holiness in these religions is one of asceticism renunciation, separation. But the problem is, there's no way you can ever be totally separated. And as aesthetic as you want to, as ascetic as you want to be, you have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to go to the bathroom. You can't escape the body that you're in. So Rav Sadok says, that modality of Kedusha is described as lightning. Because what is lightning? A brilliant flash of light 
that then plunges you into total darkness. Light, darkness, on, off. That's the holiness of dichotomy. That's the holiness of contradiction. When I give into my body, I'm not with God. And when I feed my soul and deny my body, I am with God. On, off, schizophrenia, no consistency. That is the holiness of lightning. Brilliant light, ecstasy, followed by darkness. The Torah taught the Jewish people a new way to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not by rejecting the physical, but by taking the physical and elevating it. Now there, at this point, I'm no longer living in a world of contradiction. At this point, even my physicality can be Avedis Hashem. So that's described as a torch. The difference between a torch, a lapid, and a barak, I know in Israel we have two politicians, we have Aaron Barak and, and Lapid, Yair Lapid, okay? But uh, putting the politicians aside, the difference in a Barak and a Lapid is a Barak is brilliant light followed by total darkness. A Lapid is not as brilliant as a lightning flash. It flickers, but it's constant. It gives you warmth, it gives you light, it gives you direction. So it's true, when I live a life in the physical world, Maybe the holiness of my experience is not going to be as great. But it will be enduring. I remember years ago, before they built, uh, they improved the roast at Tzvat, uh, to get to Tzvat you had to go around a mountain path over and over and over. You really got, got car sick. And, but there was, no, there was also no railing. And at night you sometimes had this sense it was extremely dangerous. The bus, God forbid, could just fall off the side of the, of the mountain. In fact, that's the old joke that they say about uh, an Egged bus driver. Now we have these other companies now, but I'll go with Egged, that's the familiar. The Egged bus driver and the great Rosh Hashiva, they died the same time, and they both came up to Gan Eden. And the Egged bus driver got in right away, and the great Rosh Hashiva, they said, well, we have to wait, we have to look through your life a little bit and determine so the Rashiva complained a little bit. Again, I'm sure a real, he wouldn't do it, but he complained. He said, you know, hey, this guy's not even from, you know, he gets in right away, and, you know, you're making me wait. So they said, well, listen, how many people did you get to say to him? You know, uh, the Egged bus driver got thousands of people to say to him over his life. He caused more horse than even you. So imagine if you had to navigate, the bus had to navigate the hairspin turns by a, without headlights, just by the light of lightning. It'd be pretty scary, it's scary anyway, you know. A flash of light, but then you're dark again. But if you even had a torch or a headlight, that can give you some confidence that you know what you're doing. Right, so that's what Rav Sadok says. Rav Sadok says, in some ways, it's almost a tragic compromise because a life of asceticism, a life of renunciation, a life of separation from the body can give me moments of ecstasy that I might not be able to have living a mundane life. But instead of going from holiness, light to darkness, I have a way of integrating. And that's what Matan Torah is. So I think Rav Sadok's word about Barak versus Lapid ties in very well with the Maharal's idea of the explanation of Masech Shabbos that the Torah is connected to three. And ultimately, we'll go back to the Rambam, right? That's our third text, where the Rambam makes the point that knowing Hashem in all your ways means your eating and your drinking and your vacation and your exercise can all be elevated. Going to museums can all be elevated as aspects to serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu as a whole person. Your body is not necessarily your enemy. Your body can be a tremendous, your physical needs, your emotional needs, they can be a tremendous vehicle that can help you in serving Hashem. So, B'yazus Hashem, we should be uh, to balance the body and the soul, that they should work in harmony. So thank you. Thank you.